Will you turn please to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 as we start our new series up. It's a time for upward growth. Winter has passed. The seed must be sown. It's time to plant. Another imagery we'll come across next week is the imagery of the building site. The site has been cleared away. It's time for us to build. And so that sense of moving upwards clearly is a scriptural theme. We look to the Lord. We thank the Lord that his son was crucified. And we look up to him and we thank God for the resurrection. We're trusting the Lord as a community of faith. Oh, I've got to tell you one more thing. I've taken a long time before I start the reading. Forgive me on that. Well, one more thing. Here's a slide for June, uh, just to encourage you that obviously we're kicking off the new series this weekend, communion service. Uh, Next week, a message on building up Father's Day, including a putting challenge on June the 20th. Baptisms, we've got a number of folks who are going to be baptized on the 27th. And if God is calling you to be baptized, then please let this be your time. Let's read the scripture together. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 1. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. And I want to pause there and say, those were very challenging, humbling words to a church that had got quite proud and was very impressed with its own knowledge. That's one of the key words. Gnosis or knowledge is a word repeated in in Corinth. And Paul has to challenge them that they're not as knowledgeable as they think they are. Verse three, why? You're still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling, it doesn't matter how spiritual we are, it doesn't matter how knowledgeable we are, if there's jealousy and quarreling, that tells us where we are with the Lord. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? I want to pause there and make a comment about social media. One of our ministers said to me the other day that he'd heard a fellow pastor say that this world is not mature enough for social media. That's become pretty obvious, hasn't it? And sometimes God's people, when we get caught up in that, it tells us where we are spiritually. Many, of course, have determined to operate in a different fashion. Verse 4, for when one says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. And Paul is repeating this theme from earlier chapters. Are you not mere human beings? Mere human beings. What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose and they will each be rewarded according to to their own labor. Last verse, for we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. And God's people said, amen. And so Paul takes us to the garden, or as some would say, to the farm. The Corinthians have been converted. They've been growing. But in the growing and in the building, there are some issues. You know, if you think of the lifetime of a tree, a tree will face many problems. And apparently it's well proven that the heavy winds that a tree will endure are very important to the development and strengthening, as it were, of the tree muscles of the tree. Sometimes a major storm or a disease or even intervention by man can knock down that tree. The Corinthians have been established, but there's clearly here a threat to their growth. And we thank God for Scripture, and we even thank God for their story and the sovereignty of God. We have this biblical letter of correction that helps us understand how to be the church. So Paul takes the church to the garden, and he helps them kind of understand their feelings and the personalities, and he especially focuses on the seed of the gospel and the work of God. He wants them to grow up, not to be immature and childish but mature. And that word should be important to us. We want to be mature. It doesn't come automatically. It comes intentionally. And by the way, maturity is not something that equates to passing an exam or just getting older or just longevity or kind of going from one base to the next. It's really about our growth in Christ. It's about abiding in Christ. It's about the Holy Spirit living within us. Jesus said, remain in me. And I will remain in you. It's about the vital relationship with Christ. If you want to know the key 
to those believers who have borne much fruit in their lives, those Christians that you would admire and love to learn from, I'll tell you something. It's about their relationship with God. It's about Christ working through them. Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's about the life of the Spirit manifesting in us. I heard a song on the Joy FM the other day, and it's called Less Like Me. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's kind of countercultural. It's probably a needed word for the time being. I really like that song. Maturity really is being less like us and much more like Christ. I want to pick up on that phrase that we stumbled across in our reading at the end of verse 4, mere humans or mere men. Um, what is it to be like uh, mere humans? And, and this is the spiritual wisdom of spiritual maturity that I want to focus on today. Okay, now think about how the world wants to see you. And let me tell the story how so many in the world want to see us. The world wants you to believe that you are just an animal. You're just another animal. Now, I don't deny our creatureliness. I don't deny that we can learn from the wonderful animal kingdom that God made, and he made us all at a similar time. But unquestionably, the scripture shows man to be the pinnacle, and so we are not animals. Nonetheless, the world tries to kind of give its dogma and give its religion to us, and it says once there was nothing, and from that nothing came everything. There was an explosion. And the planets got set up just in the right place by coincidence, the right size, the right distance, the right rotations, the right atmospheres in our solar system and all the planets that operate together. We just happen to be on the right sized Earth with the right amount of oxygen, the right amount of CO2, the right balance of the atmosphere, the right distance from the sun, and the sun is not so big that it burns us up and not too small that it burns itself out. And I love the study of Jupiter. Ju Jupiter is big enough to take the impact of the meteors that would have destroyed the Earth, but small enough so we don't get sucked into its gravity. The Earth has the right rotation so that the day doesn't get too hot nor too cold. It's at the right angle for the tilt of the seasons, the right annual journey around the sun at the right speed. And just uh, on top of that, you have the Earth's crust that happens to be just the right thickness. It's thin pan and not, it's, it's thin crust and not deep pan, uh, the crust of, the, of this world, that the tides, uh, governed by the moon are enough to move the waters, but are not, not enough to swamp us. And, and, and so, so the world said that just happened by coincidence. Just a, just a coincidence. Could have happened anywhere, the world says. And then, then life, even though we don't actually know how life began, or as evolutionists don't know how life began, and every single theory has been debunked, somehow life happened, and some of us grew up with the idea that there was a primeval swamp, which has been disproven, and there was lots of lightning, and somehow with the billions and billions of years and enough time, life will just emerge. And then from some kind of a very simple life, and it turns out that even the most simple life is highly complex, somehow we evolved over millions and millions of years and so that the knee joint which is very very complex or the eye joint somehow it happened by by lots of little random um, uh, things all taking place together uh, experts call this irreducible complexity all these little miniature solar systems within our body just so happen to to be randomly created even though they actually have to operate all together in perfect synchronicity otherwise it just wouldn't work so that's that's the theory of evolution and what we're being taught in our schools, in our universities, is that we're just an animal and that it's all about our desires. And if we feel it, we must do it. Uh, we're just nature. Nature made nature, and nature is all there is. We are mere men. We are mere humans. We are just a human animal, as the old Disney song says. The Bible tells a very different story. God made the world. And if there's anything beautiful in this world, it's because God is the designer and things work together in a remarkable way. But oh yes, we observe this world, we recognize its beauty, but we also know it's terrible as well because sin has entered in. And because we've tried acting like mere men, we've become separated from God and sin has affected the entire cosmos. But hallelujah, God still loves us and so he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, to reconcile us to God, to make us to be new creations and to give us his spirit. God always desired to breathe life into us. He breathed life into man. But as we reject God, it's as if the breath has gone from us. The wages of sin is death and yet, hallelujah, God breathes his life into us by the Holy Spirit and we are recreated. Later, Paul will say, say to the same Corinthians that we're being transformed. He'll also say we are a new creation. 
And so I suggest to you, my friend, that though I'm creaturely and though I have flesh and I am flesh, yet at the same time, I'm a life-giving spirit. Christ has given me his spirit, and so I am alive. I'm no longer a mere man. One of the dangers is that we act like we are mere men, mere humans, that nature is all there is. And so it's good for us to focus on our health. It's good for us to consider from time to time a better diet and a better exercise plan, better skin care, and we go through all that stuff. But very often what happens is that we have a tendency, especially when pressured, to neglect a healthy spiritual diet. And that's what I'm going to talk about for the rest of our time today. I want to talk about how we can grow up spiritually, even though the world is trying to drag us down to the level of being just mere men. And the first thing I want to say, in order to grow, we need a spiritual birth and a spiritual diet. I mean, if we're dead uh, to, to the Lord, as it were, if we're dead in our sins, then we need a resurrection. We need a spiritual birth. As Jesus himself said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Why did Jesus say we must be born again? As one old preacher once said, because we must. He said you must be born again because you must. You can't bypass a spiritual rebirth. In other words, in a spiritual rebirth, we say I have sinned and I'm dead. But I need that resurrection. I need Christ in me. And so first of all, make sure that you've been spiritually reborn. And then when reborn, we need a spiritual diet. Think about it. When a baby is born, everything changes. We care for the babe. When someone comes to know the Lord, if ever you've had a friend come to know Christ, you've led someone to Christ, what happens? You suddenly immediately feel a sense of responsibility as well. I'll never forget the day when... Uh, Eldest Megan came back from hospital in Torbay in the west of England. And uh, I remember it was a hot summer day. It was about 85 degrees outside. We didn't have air conditioning. It was a hot time and she was crying. And I remember Louise and I just looked at each other like, now what on earth do we do? Well, that's a question we should always ask about spiritual things when someone comes to another Lord. How can we now help them grow? And so we need a spiritual diet. And that's where the Corinthians kind of went wrong. They had a confusing spirituality and they loved to follow personalities. We'll come to that uh, later. They loved to be proud. Um, they, they, they wanted to be impressive. They wanted to be strong. And they'd forgotten the only way to be strong in the Lord is to be weak and to have his strength and his power working within us. And so verse 1, they are mere infants as we look at that challenging word there. If you like, they were Benjamin Button Christians. They were milky Christians. Instead of getting more mature, they seemed actually, after starting well, to be getting more immature. There are some believers that get dragged away by false doctrine, dragged away by issues that get bigger than Jesus, dragged away from fellowship, um, wanting to, to sin and so getting dragged away that way. It's quite possible to end up being more immature than we once were. When the thorns of this life gather around us, that healthy growth that was once taking place has gathered around us. You know something? You can be a Christian for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, and those thorns can get around you and you can lose that passion for the Lord. Matthew Henry says of this passage, they were still mere babes in Christ. They had received some of the first principles of Christianity, but had not grown up to the maturity of understanding in them or of faith and holiness. There's a popular word. And yet it is plain from several passages in this epistle that the Corinthians were very proud of their wisdom and knowledge. And so their bubble needs to be burst. Their balloon needs to be pricked. They thought they were so proud. They thought they were so strong and clever. And Paul says, no, you're spiritually immature. Again, Matthew Henry says, it is but too common for persons of moderate knowledge and understanding to have a great measure of self-conceit. In other words, sometimes... Um, when we don't know very much, we think we know a great deal. And you've probably seen it yourself. The more you know about something, very often the, the, you realize how little you do actually know. And so they were claiming to want the deep stuff. The Corinthians were saying, Paul, you're not teaching us the deep stuff. And Paul is saying, I'm afraid you're not even getting the basics right. We can't go on to the deep stuff till we start living the basics. Now, what are the basics? Well, what, what's part of our spiritual diet? Well, like I say, it's knowing God. It's knowing God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's abiding in Christ. That's the core of our faith. And then there are some things that we can do to cultivate that relationship. Of course, obedience. And part of obedience is to read the Scriptures 
and to, to, to put the scriptures into our soul so that the Holy Spirit brings back to mind the scriptures throughout the day. Uh, being part of a fellowship. Yes, attending church is a commanded spiritual discipline. Do not neglect meeting with one another. It's a commanded spiritual discipline that's vitally connected to our growing and growing up and growing upward in our faith. Sharing our faith. Prayer. Bringing the tithe and extra offerings. Winning families for Christ in this VBS season. How important to invite that family along. These are the basics of the faith. And I shared online the other day that there, there is a basic spiritual diet that you can remember very simply. First of all, to grow healthily in the Lord, we need daily devotion, a daily time with God, and for that to bleed into the rest of our day. We need weekly worship. Here's another reminder. Not monthly worship, not occasional worship, weekly worship. We need an annual focus. It does help us to kind of have a festival time, whether it's a mission trip or camp or VBS. And I've got in my heart, I'd love to do something in the fall where we could just gather together for three days and see if we can grow in the Lord. We'll see if that comes off. Please pray about that. But one thing that we often neglect, it's not just about increasing our knowledge, our time with, with the Lord, our prayer life, our worshiping life, but it's also our serving life as well. And so it's weekly worship, sorry, daily devotion, weekly worship, annual focus, and serving with our gifts. There was a famous discipleship study called Reveal that tried to investigate the discipleship strategy of a particular strong local church. And here was the conclusion. The missing link very often in church life and in spiritual maturity is service. We go to classes, and that's good. We need to do that. But if we leave it there and we don't turn it into service, our spiritual muscles just seem weakened. Hey, I'm thankful for our church. You know, next week we'll be celebrating the 4,000th meal personally delivered to people's homes at New Hope. And I'm so thankful for the catering team who've done an incredible job. But I'll tell you something. Those who receive the gift, I know are incredibly grateful and thankful. And we love you if you're one of those. But I'll tell you, those that deliver and those that cook it, are equally blessed as well. Somehow it's a blessing to get serving. So secondly, I want to say this. In order to grow, we must avoid spiritual sabotage. First of all, I'm trusting right now, and if you don't, I plead with you, be born again, experience the spiritual rebirth, and have a consistent spiritual diet. That's really important. At the same time, we need to recognize when spiritual sabotage comes our way. And that's what Paul is talking about in verse 3. You're still worldly. And so we've got a description now of some of the sabotage that was taking place in the church. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, Christian Twitter should never have the reputation that it has. It's very obvious to me, by the way, sometimes that there are those posting stuff online and they clearly don't have any non-Christian relationships. Because if you had anyone that you're trying to lead to Christ, you would never post that stuff. But um, there is a lot of jealousy and quarreling going on in this world and sometimes in the church of Jesus Christ. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Let's call it out. That's worldly. Are you not acting like mere humans? That's part of it. That's what the world wants us to do. That's what the devil wants us to do. For when one says, I follow Paul, another I follow Apollos, are you not acting like mere human beings? I want to show you this picture of a rose. And this is a picture of um, what can happen with spiritual sabotage. Here's the rose, but there are some thorns around it that can give us problems. And clearly, Paul has already mentioned jealousy. He's mentioned quarreling. I want to pause and just consider unhealthy view of personalities. And I just want to say this, church, don't follow ministers. The minister is not there for a fan club, true ministers of Jesus Christ will always desire to scupper party spirit that gathers around them. Ministers don't have fans. Ministers don't have little clones. Ministers don't play a game of you scratch my back and I'll keep you happy and you'll keep me happy. Paul asks the question in verse 5, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord has assigned to each his task. We belong to a local church, not to a favorite minister. Paul keeps saying this relentlessly through these early uh, passages in this letter. Also, here's, a, here's another um, sabotage, not using our gifts. 
If we just hold on to our gifts, we can be like that man in the parable Jesus told who just buried his treasure and thought that he could get away with it. He made all his excuses. And then not understanding the resurrection. By the way, this is a picture of the whole letter. Paul will come to using our gifts. We're going to look at uh, holiness of living uh, later as well. But not understanding the resurrection is also important to declare. We are not mere humans. We are risen in Christ. Since you have been raised with Christ, we don't see one another anymore from a worldly point of view. So let's jump on to our third and final point, shall we? Uh, in order to grow up, in order to move on upwards, so not just one past experience of growing up, in order to keep on growing, to be that strong tree that keeps going through the stages and even the decades of life. Can I suggest finally, let's team up for healthy growth. We need a spiritual rebirth. Make sure you're born again. We need a spiritual diet. In order, and we've got to avoid those spiritual sabotages that come our way through the world, the flesh, and the devil. But let's also remind ourselves here that we've got to team up for healthy growth. Look at verse 6. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. That kind of summarizes who the church is. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. It's not about keeping one another happy. We'll never succeed in that. It's not about everything's got to be done this way and I want it to be done this way. It's really about, first of all, understanding that the church is God's farm. Understand that the church is God's farm. The church is God's field, God's garden, God's farm. You know, some days in that farm, it feels like the locusts have come in and taken everything away. But there are other times when it feels like the harvest is glorious and how wonderful that is. Secondly, we are his co-workers. So as we team up for healthy growth, the scripture is showing us that it's all God's, everything is the Lord's, but isn't it wonderful that God involves you and I? We're not mere humans. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. God is working through our church. He's working through the ministers, through the members, through the deacons, through the family group leaders, through all the different um, categories, however we would categorize ourselves. Every one of us are co-workers in the Lord. I encourage you, see yourself as a co-worker. And maybe there are some listening right now. You, you know you've got to get back involved in the church of Jesus Christ because you, you can't grow while you're not serving. Otherwise, you're just surviving. I encourage you and plead with you to get involved in the church of Jesus Christ. Now, this is what Spurgeon says, the great C.H. Spurgeon. I made the mistake of reading one of his sermons on this passage because every time I read one of his sermons, I want to read the whole thing, and obviously I won't. But he says this with humor. When a great man has a large farm of his own, what would he think if Hodge, the plowman, should say, look here, I plow this farm and therefore it is mine. I shall call this Hodge's Acres. No, says Hobbs, I reap that land last harvest and therefore it is mine and I shall call it Hobbs Field. And Spurgeon asked, what if all the other laborers became Hodgeites and Hobbsites and so parceled out the land among them? I think the landlord would soon eject the lot of them. The farm belongs to its owner and let it be called by his name. But it is absurd to call it by the names of the bumpkins who labor upon it. Is that a disrespectful title to apply to laborers? Why I meant it for anybody and everybody whose name is used as the head of the party of a church. I meant Luther. Calvin, Wesley, and other great men, for at their best, as compared with their master, they are only farm laborers, and we ought not to call parts of the farm by their names. That's so relevant. Remember how Paul put it, who then is Paul and who is Apollos? Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? And then he says, know them that labor among you, and, and esteem them, esteem them highly, in love for their work's sake, but do not make them your dependents. Recollect that the ablest ministers, the most successful evangelists, the proudest teachers are with, after all, nothing but laborers on God's farm, laborers together with God. So thirdly, can we, would you agree with me on this? God labors with us and is above all. That seems to summarize this passage so well. It's God working, it's his farm, we're his workers, but it's also God's work. And he is preeminent over everything. It's all about him. I could be the most skillful farmer. I could be the best gardener in the world. But I tell you what, it's God that makes it grow. God created the very process. And it's God who is holding all things together. It was said in Colossians 1.17, In him all things hold together. Christ 
is the head of the church. And that encourages me, my friends, that Christ is the head of the church. Spurgeon says it this way one more time, one more little Spurgeon quote. The entire church belongs to him who has chosen it in his sovereignty, bought it with his blood, fenced it by his grace, cultivated by his wisdom, and preserved it by his power. So finally, I want to say God expects a harvest. God expects a harvest. The harvester is coming. We are co-workers in God's service. We are God's field. We are God's building. And it is God who is building. And it's God ultimately who is very interested in the harvest. We'll be separated between the sheep and the goats, the wheat and the tares. And so I want to ask the question, as we consider growing upward, we consider where we are with the Lord, can I ask you the question, how is your garden growing? If your life itself is also a field or a farm or a piece of land, how's it going? How are you cultivating your life? How are you cultivating your spiritual life? Have you been born again? Are you alive in Christ? Are you abiding in the vine? Is the devil trying to sabotage you with sin, with an attitude, with distraction, with isolation? See this as an opportunity today to say, God, it's, it's your garden. My, my life is yours, Lord. I'm nothing without you. My life's not my own. I've been bought with a price. Lee Strobel, I heard him on a podcast the other day. I love his writings. I met him a couple of times. He's a lovely man. Lee Strobel says that he asks himself the question once a month, what would it be like being married to me? I found that a challenging question. In fact, asking that question makes us think about our discipleship and our walk with the Lord and the kind of person that we are. You know, uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I, had a, I had a busy week last week. I went to Birmingham for a funeral and caught up with a family member, our daughter Sarah, and a, a, fr a friend, a fellow minister, and uh, came back, and, and it was through a, a tor torrential downpour. It took me almost four hours to get home, so I was, I was a little tired, and the, the, the next day was kind of full, and usual Sunday. So on Memorial Day, I found myself just falling asleep in the afternoon. Um, saw family in the morning, and just in the afternoon, I just couldn't really get going. And I think when you hit that period of, of tiredness, I'd like to think it was tiredness and not weariness. When you get to that point of tiredness, we've got to remind ourselves, we are servants. Tiredness or, or struggle does not mean it's like, well, this is all going wrong. I'm going to now think for myself. No, no, we need to care for ourselves. We need to Sabbath. We need a good vacation from time to time. But I'm telling you, the reaction of a servant must be always to say, Lord, use me. Lord, it's your field. Lord, it's your church. Lord, would you work in my life? And I tell you something, it's the most blessed thing you could ever do to work in God's farm. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, practically, we just thank you for the exciting season that June is for us as a church. Lord, we do pray for your richest blessing on all who are serving at camp and going to camp. We pray for the whole ministry, Snowbird. We pray, Lord, for your richest blessing on the VBSs taking place at our North Campus, our South Campus. A couple of weeks later, Lord, uh, at Northgate, we pray for your richest blessing, Lord. We lift the ministers to you. We pray, Lord, that all the volunteers will come in, the right folks, Lord, to be rightly trained and ready and prepared. We pray that families, Lord, will connect with us. And we dare to ask, Lord, that each campus will have new family groups as a result, Lord, of uh, this investment in our community. Lord, I pray also for faithfulness in God's farm, in our investing, in our tithing, in the extra gifts that we bring. And Father, we pray that there will be a special return, the redeemed of the Lord returning, Lord, to your table next week. May that be a holy time and a blessed time. Lord, lead us forward, lead us upward. And Lord, if there's anyone who needs to know you, I pray they will give their life to Christ right now. My friend, I encourage you, pray this prayer with me. Pray this prayer with me if you need to be born and you born again. Heavenly Father, I need to be alive in Christ. I need you in my life, Lord. And so I recognize my sin. I repent of my sin. Jesus, I thank you that you want me to be more than a mere person. Thank you that you died on the cross to give me everlasting life. Jesus, please come into my life. Raise my life to follow you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Friend, I encourage you if you prayed that prayer, go to newhopebc.news. Click on the respond tab. We'd love to hear from you. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for listening, everybody.